Greetings in Jesus' name. I'm Bishop Chester Wright, and this is the video teaching series, The Witness of God. This is lesson number 11. And uh, as I have mentioned several times in this uh, series of lessons, the conversation I had with the Lord back in the latter part of March of 2020, uh, as the Lord talked to me about what iniquity was, the complete disregard of his will and living by his will, running our own lives, making our own decisions, and even having the audacity to ask God to bless our decisions and to help us do iniquity, which are then prayers of iniquity. And I said to God, uh, how, are, how, are we going to, how are you going to send people to hell uh, and live with yourself? And I wasn't c accusing him. I, was, I wanted to understand his perspective. He said, because I am gathering a preponderance of evidence against men. I am saving all who will choose to let me save them. I'm choosing all those who choose me and saving them. But all those from all those who are rejecting me, I am gathering a preponderance of evidence. He said those that choose to let me save them, they become evidence. And those that reject me and won't let me save them, they become evidence. And he said, I have been gathering evidence since the garden, and I will, gather the, I will continue to gather evidence until the great white throne judgment. And that's my purpose. In fact, then he said, my seven dispensations that I've dealt with man, each put man humanity, flesh, in a different position, condition, with different expectations from me, giving man the opportunity to live by those expectations and reveal what was in their heart or not in their heart. And in each dispensation, I have gathered evidence so that at the great white throne judgment, no one will have an excuse because I will have proven that those that are lost have chosen to be lost. So we're going to just briefly look at the seven dispensations from this context today so that we can get some idea of what the Lord did. Uh, the dispensation or the age of innocence was the garden. God created man sinless. He gave him flesh from the dust of the earth. The angels he created, he created with his own substance, spirit. But man in the garden was created from the dust of the ground, the dust of the earth. And man became a living soul when God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Well, in that garden, in that paradise, he was only told, the only thing you can't do is don't eat of the tree, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's it. Nothing else. So he had no sin. He wasn't born with a sinful nature. He had no enemies. He had no threats. He had no sicknesses, no diseases. He ruled over all the animals. There were no danger from the animals. All he had was flesh and human will. And the age of innocence ends in the judgment of Adam and Eve being expelled from the garden. That was the judgment. It was the judgment because Eve demonstrated that Adam obviously had not told her the word that God said it, the way God said it, or she did not pay attention to it because when she had the conversation with the serpent, and we know that the serpent wasn't talking, but that the enemy, Satan, was speaking to her through the serpent, 
And it is my opinion, opinion, that considering how the adversary deals with every human being in the history of man, that the serpent wasn't audibly speaking to Eve. He was conversing her with her with thoughts he was putting in her, in her mind. And there's no evidence that any other animals in the, in the entire garden would have spoken sounds that Adam and Eve could understand. Uh, so there's no reason to believe that Eve is standing there. She would have been frightened out of her mind, you, you would have thought, if that serpent was suddenly speaking audibly. But she didn't recognize what was there. She didn't recognize what was happening. And she didn't know anything about the enemy because Satan did not have any access to the garden except through the serpent, apparently. But in the conversation, she revealed that she did not know what God said. God said, thou shalt not eat of the fruit of it. But when the serpent asked, her reply was, we can't eat, touch it or eat it lest we die. The Lord said, don't eat of it lest you die. So, perfect paradise, only one commandment, don't eat this fruit. Only one. And then, no temptations except flesh. Flesh. Evidence. When they were kicked out of the garden, uh, from that point on, there's no evidence of God giving them specific do's and don'ts. This is called the dispensation or age of conscience. And as I've taught in previous lessons, God gave, as, gives to every human being at birth, when they become a living soul, in their spirit, his voice speaks to their spirit. It's co-perception according to Strong's. And the Spirit of God teaches each human through their spirit right and wrong. And so each man has to choose whether or not to live by their conscience. So now there is sin and now there is death. Uh, now there are uh, threats. Obviously, Cain killed Abel. So now there's violence. Uh, it would appear as though that at this point in time, whatever dominion that man had over animals was no longer there, for, so now animals were going to be a threat to man. And yet, from God's perspective, the only thing God required of man or expected of man was to listen to the voice of his spirit speaking in their spirit called conscience, teaching them right and wrong from birth. And yet, when that's all that was required of, from God of them, they could not do that. And the scripture says that they uh, seared their conscience to the point that God looked down and saw that the thoughts and the uh, uh, desires of man were wicked and only evil continually. And it re he, he repented. He changed his mind. So he w was going to start over. And he started over at the flood with just eight souls who believed him. So every person from the end of the flood into the next dispensation all had an experience with God, of obeying the word of God. Every one of them. Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden because they didn't obey God. But those that were spared the judgment in the great flood at the end of the dispensation of conscience were spared because they did have a history or experience of obeying God. The next uh, period that starts after the flood 
uh, starts with mankind, and from among mankind, God chose Abraham, and uh, this was the dispensation or age of promise. God sought for men who would believe him. He chose Abraham, and Abraham and his followers uh, followed God because of promise. And as we read about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all that, it was all about the promises of God. That God didn't, their conscience still worked, but you don't find there being a long list of do's and don'ts that God gave Abraham all the way up to Moses. Uh, but they believed the promises. That was the test. It was a test of their faith. That's all they were required to do. So Abraham believed God. Isaac believed God. Jacob believed God. They go into Egypt because God is providing for them during seven years of famine. They stay in Egypt. They end up being slaves in Egypt during this period of time. All this period of time, you're going to believe the promises. Uh, Joseph actually told his sons and his uh, lineage that Israel is coming out of Egypt and going to the promised land because God has made a promise. And when you do, take my bones with you and bury them in the promised land. That's how much he believed the promise. Well, God led them out of promise, out of Egypt to fulfill the promise and when they got to the Jordan River and they saw giants in the land and all the reasons why they couldn't go in, their faith failed. And the judgment that ended the dispensation of promise uh, was 40 years in the wilderness. And at the end of the four, in that wilderness time, God gave them the law and it was full of do's and don'ts. And it was also included with that law was God giving them uh, the clear promise that they could have their sins rolled ahead by sacrifices if they believed God. So in this period of time where there was law, there was no longer a question. God wasn't was no longer causing man to have to rely strictly on conscience. Now he had, and, and he was no longer relying strictly on promise. Now he had uh, Oh, I missed one. Whew. Sorry, I missed one. Well, <laughs> not the first time, is it? Uh, so, hi, this is Chester Wright, the human. So, <laughs> I'll go back. The third dispensation was the dispensation of human government. Okay? God let man be in charge after the end of the flood. After the flood, man was in charge. Man was ruling. And the proof that man can't rule himself, even with conscience, because conscience didn't go away. Uh, man decided he was going to build a tower that would prevent God from being able to destroy him again through a flood. Well, God had already promised Noah he would never do a flood again. They had a promise through their father, Noah. Their ancestor, Noah, received the promise after the flood that God would never again destroy the world with a flood. But they didn't trust that word. They didn't trust God. They proved they didn't trust God by the tower they built. So then God judges them simply by confusing their languages and scattering them throughout the earth like he told them to do it in the first place. So we have all these languages today because of man's refusal. So we've got innocence, 
and then we've got human conscience, excuse me, innocence, conscience, then man governing himself under God at God's direction and oversight, but, but man being in charge. Man was in charge, and man proved what he would do when he was in charge. And then God, after the Tower of Babel, began to deal with man through Abraham. And this, then came the time of promise. This is a time of faith. So it was innocence, conscience, humans being in charge, faith. Well, they proved that they did not believe because they would not go in. That was the judgment at the end of the time of promise. And now comes law. And law came so sin could be specified. So man would know exactly what sin was and what it wasn't. What God expected them to do and what he expected them not to do. And so when you consider those first four, uh, first five, excuse me, there I went again, those first five uh The first four, excuse me. When you consider the first four dispensations, there was very little specific instruction that came from God over what man should do and shouldn't do. And he couldn't live for God simply because he was innocent, because flesh was flesh. He could not uh, obey God and, and please God by just following his conscience because that conscience was corrupted. He could not obey God uh, when God let him be in charge. He did his own thing when he was in charge, human government. And then man could not obey God simply when all he was expected to do was believe the promises of God. So in the next stage of God's testing of man, so that man, and he's, looking, he's doing all this in the light of the great white throne judgment, so he can be just, so that man will have no excuse. Then in the law, he gave all of these details, all these details. Thou shalt, thou shalt not, all of them. And because I know you're not going to be able to keep them, <laughs> because the Bible says that Christ was the Lamb of God slain from before the foundation of the world, so God's always planned and provided a way to be saved out of whatever dispensation a person was a part of. Uh, he, he created the systems of sacrifices and means for them to give up their best lamb or whatever in order to have their sins rolled ahead because blood had to be shed. All the way back in the garden, in every one of these situations, blood had to be shed for redemption in whatever way it was. So... Moses, the law, the dispensation of the law, or the age of the law, existed from Moses all the way to Jesus Christ. And of course, by the time Jesus came on the scene, the man Christ Jesus, uh, the faith in God was polluted by so much, so much of man's own concepts of right and wrong added into to it, which is called traditions that happened over the course of time. And the, the, the traditions of the elders or the fathers were equated as being equal to the words of God. And they believed that people were just as eternally liable for following their traditions as what God had said. And of course, the judgment that ended the dispensation of the law was the crucifixion of Christ where the Lord Jesus Christ took all of the punishment for their failing to please God during this dispensation of the law upon himself and paid their price. The innocent dying for the guilty. He who knew no sin was made sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So, in innocence, man still sinned because he had flesh. And that flesh had a will of its own. 
Eve was deceived. Adam chose Eve over God. They were kicked out. Dispensation of conscience. Man, all man had to do was live, do right and wrong according to what God's spirit spoke to man. But he still had flesh and he still had his will. And so he became evil in every thought and intent of his heart. And then God gave man uh, the opportunity to be in charge through human government. And instead of glorifying God with this, after these are the, 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 those who were, came into existence after the great flood that knew about the great flood, knowing God's displeasure upon man, still chose because of flesh and self-will to go that direction. And therefore God judged them by confusing their language. And then those that were given the opportunity to believe God by promise and all they had to do to please God was have faith because Abraham's faith was accounted or accredited to him as righteousness. So, and we know if you read the, the story of Abraham in Genesis, he was not a perfect guy. He was not a perfect guy. He was not a perfect guy, but he believed God and it was accredited to him for righteousness. But even with that, living by those promises and knowing that faith could be accredited for righteousness all the way from Adam to Moses, man still failed to do it because of flesh and his human will. He made choices contrary to God. And then God says, okay, I'm going to tell you everything I want you to do and not do. And so now you know. But man, not having the ability to do those things themselves, which the law proved. The law proved that man's problem wasn't not knowing what was right and wrong, not knowing the do's and not knowing the, not, the don'ts. The problem was his flesh and his will that had no ability to do these things themselves. And so they had to do all these sacrifices, which roll the sin of the dispensation of the law all the way to Calvary. And all of those sins for the entire hundreds of years that the law was in existence was paid for by Christ himself on the cross. Well, after his resurrection and ascension in heaven, the new age started. This is the age of grace. We call it the age, the church age, the dispensation of grace. Well, this is different. This is different because in the first five dispensations, God was with them. But in this dispensation, something new is, has happened. This is a new time, a new covenant, a new testament, because God is now in us. And now man has no excuse for not being able to do the do's and not do the don'ts because God, if man acknowledges he's not able to do it and surrenders himself to God, then God will do the do's and not do the don'ts through man. And even then, if, we, if our flesh and our will makes the wrong choice, if we will choose, he will forgive us even of those choices if we choose to repent and acknowledge that what we did was wrong and ask him to forgive us, he'll do it. He'll do it. And yet still, with that, that being the case, with God not just being with us but being in us, flesh and human will still chooses to do its own thing. Well, the judgment at the end of the church age is such that God is taking the church off the earth, putting the church in a chamber for rest and for uh, protection, and then he's going to pour out his wrath for seven years upon the earth. And he will use every conceivable means to pour out wrath. And if you read what the scripture prophesied, that he's pouring out the wrath upon man's iniquity, He's pouring out the wrath of God on man's iniquity. During this seven years of, uh, of time, uh, 
God is going to turn back to, he's going to bring the Jews, turn the Jews back to him as a nation. It's not talking about the individual. The individual still got to decide to be saved themselves. But the plan of salvation on the earth during those seven years is the same one it was at the end of the previous covenant because that 144,000 preached the same thing that John the Baptist preached. And so they would repent and they would be baptized, but there was no Holy Ghost to receive. And so at the end of that period of time, the Antichrist and his forces are going to come against Israel to destroy them. And Christ is coming with all the church and destroy the Antichrist and his army in the battle of Armageddon. That will be the fat final part of the judgment of God against those to whom much is given, much is required. This is what he's made available to mankind for 2,000 years, which he had never done before. But flesh and self-will has rejected, for the most part, what God has offered. Rejected it. So, then comes the seventh dispensation. When Christ comes back to destroy the Antichrist and his army, he is then going to, as he's promised the Jews and promised all the way back to, back to Abraham and David, he's going as Christ, as God, as the King of kings and Lord of lords, he's going to sit on, sit on the throne of David in Jerusalem. And he's going to rule and reign over the earth for 1,000 years. And the church is going to be in glorified bodies. We're going to be kings and priests ruling and reigning with him in the earth. And some, as the scripture says, going to be rulers over 10 cities and some over four cities and some over two cities because not every single talent person was going to be unfaithful to God. And, and all of this. And so for 1,000 years... Every excuse man has used from the garden all the way to this point is going to be confronted and eliminated. Adam fellowship with God every day in the garden before he sinned and was cast out. But God, in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, as the visible, visible image of the invisible God, is going to be sitting on the throne as God, and he's going to be sitting on the throne as king of the earth. And he will be a righteous king. And so there will be no excuses any man can use for the government. And the local government is going to be church in glorified bodies. So there's no sin. There's no agenda. There's no, no governor or mayor or whatever living by their own will, by their own agenda. And the same people that are our governors are our preachers. And again, they will, have, they will be perfect. Glorified bodies. Glorified bodies. No sin. No wrong agenda. No failing. No excuses to blame on the preacher. None. Not only that, there will be no sickness. There will be no sin. Excuse me, there'll be no sickness. There'll be no accidental death. The scripture says, the sinner being a hundred years old shall perish. Nobody's going to die under a hundred years old. And most important of all, all this stuff has been blamed on the devil from the serpent all the way through. The Satan is, Satan is going to be bound for the entire thousand years. There will be no tempter. All of the forces of the adversary are going to be bound. Man will have no demonic influence to sin at all for that thousand years. But at the end of the thousand years, Satan is going to be loosed. He's going to persuade the sinners of the world to gather together with him in an army to come against Christ in Jerusalem to wipe them out. And that's when God is going to do, do the final judgment on earth called the the battle of Gog and Magog, where God consumes them, wipes them out. And immediately after that will be the great white throne judgment. How in the world 
Can humanity live under God as the king and our God where everybody can see his face and everybody can know who he is and there won't be any question who God is and where our, our rulers and our preachers are in glorified sinless bodies that are doing perfectly the will of God where there's no sickness, there's no accidental death and no devil and yet there will be sinners. Why? Flesh and human will. And in these seven dispensations of God's different dealings of man, all of these contribute, in every one of them, those that choose God and those that reject God, contribute to the preponderance of the evidence that at the great white throne judgment, when God says, depart from me, because your name's not written in the Lamb's book of life. He will be righteous. He will be righteous. So I'm summarizing it this way. From each dispensation's conditions and requirements, God is gathering evidence against man and has gathered. Those who obey him during a dispensation receive the promises that he made to man that are specific to that dispensation. The promises made to each dispensation are different. But man, God will be faithful in giving to each, those who believe him and obey him in each dispensation will receive the promises of God in each dispensation. But those who will not obey him within the bounds of that dispensation provide further evidence that the righteous judge uses against mankind at the great white throne judgment. I don't know which dispensation, either grace or the millennial kingdom, will be the one that will have the worst time in hell. Because in grace we've had God in us, or at least he's been available to be God in us. And in the millennial kingdom, it's the most perfect environment on the earth since the garden. And yet, men are lost in every dispensation. I hope and pray that at this point you can see, clearly see, that this righteous judge who is our loving God has not just in a short effort tried to save man, but he's given man chance after chance after chance after chance after chance. But I say this to the church before I conclude. In every dispensation, the one who was chosen by God, selected by God, and given the opportunity by God to be the one or the ones through whom God would fulfill his plan and purpose for that dispensation. Those that were faithful to that selection were honored by God and blessed by God for it. And those who chose not to participate in his plan for them as a part of his kingdom, they receive and will receive the greatest measure of punishment here on earth and in hell of anyone in that dispensation. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the name of Jesus, I loose the spirit of the love of God, the spirit of the grace of God, the spirit of the fear of the Lord upon us, the spirit of revelation and wisdom and the knowledge of him that we might see and hear and know and believe his word and that by his grace, we would give ourselves completely to him, surrendering our will and our lives to him for his plan and purpose sake, to his glory only, in Jesus' name, amen.